Hi, welcome to Beyond the Filter. I'm your host, Liz Ryerson, and I'm here with Liz Pelly. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. My name is Liz. I live in New York. I'm a music journalist and also involved in some other projects like running an online publication and uh, contributing to the art space silent barn and playing music in a few different projects and then as far as how I got started working as a music journalist I started writing about music for like the local alt weekly on Long Island when I was a teenager and then my sister and I had a music blog for a while and then I did like some freelancing when I was in college for different publications but yeah I guess like the beginning was kind of interning at an alt weekly when I was in high school and then when I graduated from college I worked at an alt weekly in Boston and you know was like involved in going to like really shitty shows on Long Island when I was a teenager and kind of like weird like emo and hardcore shows and stuff and luckily I've discovered like different types of sounds and communities since then <laughs> um, but yeah so I worked at an Alt Weekly in Boston, and then when it shut down, one of my friends and I started this publication called The Media, which is found online at fuckthemedia.com with a V instead of a U. And over the past five-ish years, I'd say, you know, a lot of my time has been spent sort of balancing, keeping that project going, maintaining a freelance career as a journalist, um, writing for different places, and then also making time for stuff like uh, for Three years I was on the programming team at Silent Barn booking shows and also playing music and things like that. So can I ask you um, what attracted you to music writing in particular? Hmm. Well, it's hard because it's just kind of, like I said, I was like a teenager when I started writing about music. And I honestly think that I kind of got into it like through having a live journal because when I was a teenager, I used to go to a lot of shows and then I would come home and write about them either on like live journal or I think that before that it was like blurdy and probably some other things too, or I'd write about on like MySpace bulletins or something. And, and also like I started journaling at a really young age um, and was just always kind of writing. So I think that, you know, I was always interested in writing and then growing up in the suburbs, I think music just sort of like provided an outlet to something that was more interesting than what was happening at school and access to like sort of feeling part of something and it's interesting because I kind of still think that about music like one of the most inspiring and important parts of it is how it kind of like allows an outlet for participation for not just young people but like being part of a a music community just like we live in like a pretty like isolating world and it's pretty cool that people can still be involved in booking shows and going to shows as this like rare example I think of something that gets people together in the same room. Yeah, it's true. It's one of the the very rare examples of like some sort of communal activity. Like I said, I grew up going to like emo and hardcore shows on Long Island, which are pretty, that was a pretty misogynist scene. And it was pretty hard as like a young girl to see myself as a participant in terms of like being a musician or like wasn't really encouraged to uh, start a band or didn't even really enter like the realm of possibility but you know like writing and taking photos and stuff or like helping wire for shows like seemed like this thing that was possible for me I actually didn't start playing music until I was 24 even though I had been going to shows since I was like 12 and yeah I feel like that was it was like a long path of kind of like unlearning this idea that like certain roles were like available to me within the scope of being involved in music and I feel like those can be very internalized in you know something like music it's a sphere that has existed for long enough to where there's certain like cultural ideas about who gets involved and who doesn't and they're incredibly difficult to to shake because there's a lot of like power to those myths or whatever yeah for sure that's why i think that you know stuff like girls rock camp is so powerful and important and there's this trend of these first timers festivals happening in like different cities and community spaces like all over the world where they encourage people who come from you know like identities that aren't traditionally represented in music scenes and there's usually some sort of criteria where it has to be your first show and it kind of like encourages you know people to just play their first show 
That's cool. Yeah, I've been seeing more and more stuff about that. I think it's like, it's interesting for me, like my brother is more seriously involved with like the music scene and putting on shows and stuff. And he always has been. But like, I was a very awkward and antisocial kid and grew up in the middle of nowhere, basically. So there wasn't really opportunities to go to shows unless you were like super adventurous. And I was on the computer all the time. So I ended up just kind of making music on the computer and like being on like a lot of different online communities, like a lot of different online music communities and other communities. And that's sort of how I like made and disseminated stuff, but it feels like a much different sort of network. I don't know. It's the, it's the kind of like contradictions between, I guess I, I feel that like if you're making and disseminating stuff primarily online in the music world that isn't necessarily, it's very performance based, so that's not necessarily taken as seriously. But on the other hand, like doing that, like most primarily online music communities that I've been a part of or I've been around have been super toxic as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. But anyway, like the the reason that I got interested in your writing um, was probably the reason a lot of people got exposed to your writing was through the article that you wrote for The Baffler about Spotify and some of the problems with it's called the problem with music and it you talk about how streaming services are it well in particular spotify is basically defining the music industry and defining the kind of music not just how people disseminate music but the kind of music that is being made and being distributed so do you want to talk a little bit more about that yeah for sure and you know i think that a lot of like my interest in in writing about spotify and the impact that it's happening having on the way that music is created and the way that people music is shared and the way that people come together on music um has a lot to do with like you know a lot of the things i was saying earlier is that to me like music has always been about um you know participation or like finding out about communities um or like kind of like seeing like this bigger picture of a music culture and one of the main issues that i sort of take with spotify is just like this general way that i feel like it's like really watering down our relationship with music and flattening a lot of um you know the connections and sounds and yeah just so I talk in the piece, I talk a lot about the impacts that Spotify has had on aesthetics of music by like, it's really popular to go on to Spotify and like on the front page, um, you know, see a lot of these sort of chill playlists. And I've definitely heard from different musicians who talk about how the, and different musicians and labels who talk about how like some music does really well on the platform and like some music doesn't do very well on the platform. And that's more often like the like, chill or like smooth or like pop oriented stuff that does really well and then like you know the more challenging music uh that that doesn't really find an audience as much on the platform so like that's like one thing and then i also just feel like you know the spotify playlists are made um, by a combination of in-house curators that spotify employs as well as their algorithmic playlists um, and then there are also playlists that are just created by major labels Um, like major labels have all different types of influence over the platform in terms of you know they have direct relationships with the Spotify in-house curators they have playlists that they have access to Uh, they have playlists that they create on their own that have like fairly prominent placement on the front page but I mean um like in the browse tab but not like super prominent um and then they also have um like free advertising so if you have the free version of Spotify you, you'll often see you know major label influence like all over the platform um, you said in one of the articles that there were a bunch of ads for Ed Sheeran for example yeah totally you know like if there's like a big release coming out there will be you know a lot of ads like in the free version of spotify and i actually recently switched back to the free version of spotify because um i thought it was you know like important to see like what the advertising looks like and stuff and something i noticed a lot is like like spotify i mean um the major labels have each have like their own playlisting brand um so like sony owns this thing called filter and then um there's also the other companies are called Digster and Topsify, and you'll see uh, like their playlists on the platform. But also, you know, they also have these ads that to me kind of remind me of like ads for like the like now that's what I call music compilations. Like you'll be listening to like a Spotify playlist for 
for example, like um, today's top hits or something, and then like three tracks in, you'll hear a commercial for like um, for a playlist called like '90s Smash Hits, all of your favorite '90s throwbacks, and it'll be like you know, um, it'll play a little clips of like all of those songs in this ad, and you know, I don't know. For some people, it's probably hard to differentiate like what is the Spotify content, what's the commercials, or um, whatever, and yeah, so. All of that is um, pretty, it's just sort of, to, to me, I feel like a lot of the the way that um, the, all of this, like, c- content pushed on the first page of Spotify is, like, uh, I don't know. I just feel like there's people kind of, like, give up their, there's a lot of, like, the platform trying to, like, take people's agency away from them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. Fair enough, like, there's, like, an article that came out a few days ago that was, like, you know, Spotify will only impact, um, in that way, will only impact listeners who, like, aren't, like, super discerning and don't already have, like, their, like, idea of what they want to listen to or whatever. But if we're, you know, trying to, like, push culture in the right direction, I kind of feel like, um, I don't know, I still think that, I still, like, take issue with the way that, that platforms will try to, like, shape culture and shape the sound of music and shape what people are listening to well the the thing the thing with that is like most of these like content models assume that people's interests in art are static right like you have this one thing that you really want or that you really are looking for and you know there's this category for it but like that doesn't mesh at all with the way that like i feel like i listen to music i mean like maybe people get pushed into different realms or different spheres because of these things existing but i don't think that there's any sort of fact that you know you're a x person or you're a y person those are categories that are created and defined by the market and you're sort of reacting to them so this idea that like you know a certain person likes x or a certain and and that that like these fears aren't basically um creating what people want or what people desire um is foolish i think yeah i i totally like i i see what you mean and i agree i feel like like these platforms are so powerful they're so big and there's so much money behind these companies like they are shaping culture and uh like pushing it in direction that fulfill you know their business goals and um that's like pretty it's pretty frightening i think to see like the whole of music being expected to conform to this platform that at the end of the day will only have its own business interests in mind. Yeah. Well, and I think the whole rhetoric of Silicon Valley sort of masks the ways in which it does it because there's this kind of like worship of data and the numbers. And there's this feeling that what you're doing is merely an extension of gathering and and spitting out data um, back at, at users and organizing it in the way that you as the smart you know, enlightened programmer or whatever uh, can can do that. And there's no sort of acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, your company obviously has to make money and grow and, and therefore um, what you communicate with your piece of technology and, and the ways that you shape the spheres are like serious and big and real. Like, I feel like there's sort of almost like an abdication of responsibility because there's this view that like, Oh, it's just all the numbers and we're just, we're just serving them or whatever. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I have one thing that you, uh, wrote down or that's, fr- that I wrote down from your, um, I, I think this was actually your first article about streaming, um, about this, the streaming, I forget what it was called. Oh, the uh, secret lives of playlists. Yes. Uh, So this is from the end of that article. It says, The music and tech industries have yet to really acknowledge the ways in which Spotify and playlist culture are uh, unapologetically harming independent music. The pro-data business model that favors no one but pop stars, uh, yes, but also the ways in which playlisting waters down human relationships through with music through cold and automated ways of programming, all in order to corporatize art literally 
literally make music fit into Spotify and Apple and Deezer and Google Play's tiny square tinted boxes. And instead of pushing back on this reductive way of thinking, instead thus far we've only seen a flurry of puff pieces about playlist curators as secret hit makers and features praising them as unsung heroes. So uh, as far as that, that last sentence, why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is hasn't been like any real I, I guess until maybe your art your other article um any real serious spotify or uh challenge to spotify and and these like content models within the music press and the music like sphere yeah it's interesting because um i kind of feel like for a while there is this attitude because I, I do feel like recently we've started seeing more if not like criticism just more conversation about the pros and cons of streaming and stuff but i think for a while people really felt powerless to maybe like you know spotify and this model in general because everyone is saying this is the future um and i think that a, a lot of artists um you know even if the check that they're getting from spotify is only like a few hundred dollars every few months or, you know, a thousand dollars a year or whatever, like most artists like can't afford to, you know, say no to that or can't afford to like jeopardize like any ounce of support that they will get from this platform. So I think that's why a lot of artists are, um, you know, like pretty uh, like weary to publicly criticize any of these companies. They're very powerful. And then also, you know, a lot of outlets like have engaged in, partnerships with these platforms or maybe they're hoping that in the future like they might have like a playlist that gets featured on the front page of browse or like maybe these publications will have podcasts and spotify will feature them on their podcast tab mm -hmm. or something like what these platforms like you know that the work of our musicians and journalists and publications like is increasingly sort of becoming at the, at the whim of not just spotify but you know like artists and publications like rely on all of these platforms for connecting with people and getting their work seen and heard and stuff like that. So I, I guess it kind of, you know, makes sense why people have been so um, hesitant to um, say anything critical. And I also think that, you know, the, um, the reality of these platforms, um, especially Spotify, like they're just sort of starting to like, come to light like I don't, I don't think that a lot of people maybe really had even started having conversations of like the the downsides of, of these like you know the dark sides of a data-driven digital music culture um, and I yeah I think that you know the, the conversation is um is increasing um and at a certain point like you know it has to come to a head I don't know like there has to be some sort of eventually but it's still pretty um hard to say like when or where or how that will happen um yeah I, I guess my concern is like I, I if if you're a musician or you know an artist or whatever maybe you're used to getting scraps uh for your yeah. work so you'll accept that from Spotify. But, like, there's this, like, promise of, like, you know, that promise of visibility or whatever. I think I think the problem is, well, first of all, like, it's, like, it's, it's basically winning the lottery because, like, and especially if you're not making music that is intended on courting this platform and fitting into some particular genre. And even if you are making that kind of music, if you don't have the necessary connections or like, you know, a, whatever sort of ways into the industry, then it's not very likely that, you know, you'll be an artist that people know about. And that's the other thing, like people are not engaging with music actively on these platforms. Like a lot of these artists are um, like, they're not like, artists that anyone knows their name like they're just listening to these playlists so it's not even like name recognition it's not really like causing people to to investigate anything further you know to go on those artists websites or whatever or follow them on social media it's not like inspiring curiosity in music at all it's really just this passive platform and yeah. that's the thing like 
it seems like you might have a lot to gain from like this theoretically infinitely large audience but in reality it's not like even if you do get on those things like unless you're like somebody who's a super mainstream pop star with like a lot of name recognition which you're not going to be unless you already are that like mm -hmm. then it doesn't really help you get fans or like you know introduce you into a sphere where people are engaging with your art, you know, on the level that you probably want them to engage with it. Yeah, totally. It's like when you have a platform that so very much prioritizes playlists over artists and labels, it's like creating a culture where people are becoming fans of playlists instead of fans of artists. And in the articles that I've written, I've talked about how Spotify prioritizes playlists over albums. But I really do think it's like, you know, from what I can tell, Spotify's goal is that people will find playlists that they like and keep going back to those playlists, not necessarily keep going back to certain artists or certain albums or anything like that. And when you listen to, you know, like playlists or albums, it, it's, I think, kind of, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's like waters down the relationship that people have with music. Um, and, you know, some people argue that playlists have, created a culture where people are listening to more a higher number of artists which might be true but I think that when you get that you also feel people are having um you know uh less it's it, it affects people's uh relationship with you know like really getting into an artist and really getting familiar with their whole catalog and actually becoming fans like I feel like it creates this disconnect where um you know if, if streaming is supposed to be like you know, um, I kind of feel like everyone talks about how, you know, artists don't make money off of recordings anymore, or like streaming, but they make money off of shows and other stuff. But like people aren't going to become uh, dedicated fans enough to go to their shows or, you know, like go buy their record or whatever if they're just becoming fans of playlists instead of fans of artists yeah i mean a lot of people don't even investigate what artists are on that playlist they don't even like they just like passively listen to it and and but the thing is like like again even if you're on those playlists it 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 makes you feel disposable because that that's essentially like what it is you're treated your art is treated as disposable and like you know you might be able to get this one thing on this playlist but unless you keep sort of pumping that out in this sort of industrial way um then you're you're not going to keep showing up on these playlists and and you know like it's it's not really i don't know i just remember when uh people were engaging with artists uh on the basis of uh this this one is interesting or this one is isn't and like i don't know i i think that like <sighs> It just it, things have changed so rapidly, and like the idea that anyone thinks that because this thing is the biggest thing and it's the only option, and no one makes money off of music anymore unless it's from shows or from that, then like it it's just it's just depressing. It's depressing, and like you think like I mean my my feeling is like you think that more people would react to that and be like holy shit, this is fucked up. Like, let's talk about this. Like, th there's this sense of anger or sense of, like, something has to give. Because, like, I don't know, from being involved in uh, spheres of music online, you know, where people are primarily releasing through Bandcamp, there's a lot of good artists that are, that are doing that, but, like, it, they're not being written about. They're not being... Th th and, like... There, it's not like there isn't unique music being made out there, but like what it's not getting out to people in the way that I feel like maybe it was before. And like, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think like, I, I just think about how like the, the culture of music blogs and, and a lot of that stuff was in, in the, the mid to late two thousands. And I think there were a lot of problems with that stuff, but like it, it feels like so much vastly better compared to as far as getting people to engage with particular artists or have an idea of like have some sort of curiosity about music, investigate uh, different sort of trends and, and genres or whatever. And like, you know, I, I, I maybe have some issues with that, but it like it, it, there's, there's no comparison to like something like Spotify 
yeah. as far as like, you know, what kind of what kind of listening and what kind of engagement it encourages. Totally. Yeah. Like I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I had a music blog from around like 2008 until I don't know, maybe 2012, I think with my sister. And I kind of feel like during that time, like there was just this sense that, you know, sharing, you know, just discovering artists that no one had ever heard of and writing about them and sharing with other people who were running music blogs was just more fun. And something I, you know, jokingly talk to my friends about a lot is how like there's not that really very many like fun spaces online for sharing music anymore um and I'm like such a shill for Bandcamp and I I you know usually try not to like shill for like any kind of like company because it seems disingenuous but I yeah. really think that Bandcamp is like one of the only fun things on the internet anymore having to do with music because um you can like you know have like a fan page and follow your friends and then they can see what kind of music like you're buying or downloading and um uh you know you'll get emails when your new like your favorite labels or labels that you follow put out new stuff or when your friends buy new stuff and it kind of seems like that to me that's like a maybe like a, a glimmer of uh, hope or something that like there can be a um, like alternative. Um, but uh, it, yeah, I consider Bandcamp like one of the only non evil <laughs> big content platforms. And, and I say that like, I mean, for all I know, Bandcamp could make, you know, serious changes and fuck up their platform, you know, in another year or two. Um, yeah. But for now, at the very least, yeah, that's why I'm hesitant because I think it's like good to always be like questioning um, and to be skeptical that, like you know, I don't know, just kind of like be critical of everything. But yeah, totally. Like right now, it kind of seems like you know one of the places where also artists can release their music and actually get paid for it <laughs> um, in a way that it is um, you know accessible to um, most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like this is an example of, um, the, the way that, that things have shaped so rapidly in music is sort of an example of like the, the idea of the Overton window, like people's expectations. And I guess that, that more explicitly relates to politics, politics, but I feel like people's expectations and desires and like what they're looking for is defined so much by what's out there and, and, and the age. And like, I think the thing with like music blogs and stuff is that like, this was a point when, uh, in like the late two thousands, when, um, more and more people were on the internet, were using, um, you know, more people were getting on through Facebook or whatever, more people were starting blogs, but things were not so centralized yet to where all of our kinds of engagements are defined and, uh, you know, aggregated in one particular way. So I, I think it's like this part of the reason that that there was that culture is like there's enough of a substantial engagement on the internet to where people anyone can start blogs or whatever and people can disseminate uh music relatively easily because high-speed connections have become more um you know ubiquitous but um but now we're we're sort of in the place where uh, a lot of these uh, companies with resources and venture capital money and all that kind of stuff have found ways to uh, basically undermine that, but to to colonize it basically to um, you know like it, it was originally maybe more a wild west situation, and now the the big companies like the big oil barons and and all that stuff have have come in and you know that landscape is defined by them now um but it's weird to have so much of this stuff happen so rapidly and you know to be able to remember that but like we're be in a fundamentally different age like only 10 years later where things are just totally different um so i don't know like i i don't know what that does to like it just feels like there's a there's a amnesia and that it like 
usually like there's a generational amnesia with with anything but it feels like the cycle is a lot faster now yeah totally i feel like we've you know really rapidly um you know shifted from a a time when um you know being online uh you felt like being engaged the community who had the same interests as you um and you know a little bit more like an actual mechanism for people who without resources to um sell their art or connect to the community and and now you know everything is so like centralized and tightly controlled that it just feels way way more like product oriented like everything that you do is just serving the final product of these big tech companies whether it's like you know because all of our interactions are our mind for data that ultimately goes back into benefiting something like, you know, Spotify or, or Facebook or something, um, or because all the platforms are just like, you know, advertising platforms. <laughs> um, uh, but it, yeah, it's just this really weird. I was thinking the other day about how the internet now feels like it's like super product oriented, but like minus any part where like, artists who are helping create that product for tech companies could benefit like in any way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think like, I don't know. I actually, I think this, um, I, I think a lot of artists are naive about the situation and they don't really understand the ways in which they're doing this because um, I think these tech companies have sort of taken advantage of the lack of awareness of what these models actually are, how they achieve what they do, um, and like also in an industry that was already kind of failing and falling apart, anything that seems like some kind of answer to to give, like especially to give the big the big uh, music companies, some more sources of revenue seems like, you know, that's the thing with energy behind it. That's the thing to get behind or whatever, even though, you know, you're compromising so much other things. And I guess that comp that compromise is not put in your face in the way that maybe it used to be before, you know, like, I think the funny thing about you writing an article called The Problem with Muzak is you're referencing that article by Steve Albini that he wrote in the early 90s called The Problem with Music, where he talks about the problem of signing with major labels and that the ways that you're sort of signing yourself away uh, by getting a major label contract. And it feels like that article um, sort of comes uh, during the, the grunge era or, you know, the era of the early 90s when a lot of like more independent artists were being signed to major labels and then getting fucked over through various means. Um, and it feels like there was a lot of pushback about that. So there's a lot of awareness of these major labels um, for people who pay attention to music being something that is essentially an exploitative force. And, you know, like the idea of you meeting with the PR person and, and, and signing a contract or something is different from, you know, you just being on some sort of content platform. So maybe there isn't like this awareness of what people are actually participating in because of the night naivete about how art is dis disseminated. And also like, I feel like I, this is sort of where your article, uh, your interview with, uh, Matt Dryhurst to, uh, as a content platform. What was the name of that platform? Oh, um, it's a uh, Matt Dreyer's project is called Saga. Saga. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, one other thing I'll say about the problem of music is that, uh, you know, that article, I definitely feel like, you know, the problem of music was describing this thing that was, you know, this phenomenon that was a problem for artists who are getting into these like really exploitative contracts with major labels. And I kind of feel like the difference now is that like, literally all artists are expected to conform to this platform that only really is working for major labels. And like, and at the end of that piece, you know, Albini is like, some of your friends are already this fucked. And now I feel like it'd be like, all of your friends are definitely already this fucked. Like, this is a platform that is literally affecting everyone who is an artist. And that's kind of like why I started writing about it. It's just sort of, you know, uh, realizing that it was something that everyone was always talking about, like being involved in a music community, you'd hear 
I hear so many people involved with labels talking about like, you know, how the system wasn't working for them. And then once I wrote the article for what about playlists, like so many people, every time I went out, someone else would be like, Oh my God, let me talk to you about Spotify. And it just was like, this is a really pervasive platform that is having really bad or like, you know, just pre presenting like so many problems for so many different types of artists. And um, yeah, I don't know. Just wanted to like throw that in. <laughs> Oh yeah, no problem. I I feel you definitely did hit a nerve with that article from from what I was able to like grasp from seeing the engagements with it online and you know all the different sort of podcasts that you've been on about it, yeah. uh, which is which is a good thing. Um, but it's sad that like you know one person needs to essentially make that argument because and no because no one else is going to because there aren't maybe enough people who are actually engaged with the nuances of what spotify does and also care about writing about music like finding that overlap of somebody who cares about you know exploitative tech companies and then also cares about the effect on art like that's something that i have a lot of problems finding because it's not like it's hard to make an argument to people. And I don't know if this is a cultural difference between the U.S. and other places, but it, it's just hard to make the argument to people that art is inherently worthwhile, especially when it's not massively distributed entertainment. Like, people in the U.S. accept that, like, if something is part of mass culture, then it's, you know, it's valid and worth talking about. But if it's just an artist making some random piece of art then uh then it's seen as like this indulgent or masturbatory thing and like that's what i have such trouble with because like if you're making or disseminating a piece of art like you're always doing it within the context of a particular culture and a particular idea and it's always going to be different a little bit different depending on the era that you're making it because of the tools that you're using and all that kind of stuff and also the cultural landscape that you're reacting to and I think there's a lot that can be said about almost any piece of art that, you know, is out there that somebody is making and disseminating. Um, the idea that this, uh, that we only have to sort of react to this mainstream uh, culture when it becomes so ubiquitous and we can't uh, build our own idea of uh, of a different culture of something that, you know, talk about that that allows us to talk about um art in a more nuanced way then that's really depressing and that that's really like disempowering fundamentally for people who want to be able to express and conceptualize that there's any possibility for something different for something better for sure i mean like i definitely feel that we were talking about this a little bit earlier but you know there are a lot of folks who write about, you know, the exploitative ten tendencies of, like, big tech companies, but not, there hasn't really been, like, or there hadn't been, like, a lot of conversation about the um, effects that tech companies were, exploitative tech companies were having on music, and I kind of feel like in order to, like, fully have that conversation and for people to, like, think about musicians and artists in relation to the way that they're being um, you know, completely exploited by these billion dollar companies, like we'll have to require a complete rewiring of the way that society has always thought about cultural work and the way people have always expected, um, you know, musicians and artists to do stuff for free or because they love it. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I'm always often when I think about this too reminded of like a few years ago, I did this interview with Asher Taylor where she made this really good point and she was talking about how you know, today, like with the sharing economy and people in such like a precarious, um, you know, in these precarious labor conditions are like expected to like work like they love it and like work, be like artists and be like piecing together these like freelance careers and like everyone is expected to like act like artists and like the um, sort of like attitude about work is like kind of you know, I feel like that's another way in which, like, the narrative or, like, surrounding, like, artists and musicians is sort of, like, exploited in this way. Um, and uh, it makes it, like, even that much more dire that, like, artists and musicians and people involved in, like, cultural work, like, don't, like, allow this to happen. 
Um, that makes sense. Like, I don't know. I keep thinking about um, there was during the Grammys, there were these Uber commercials that were on. <laughs> drivers. I don't know if you saw these, but like the, the drivers were like struggling musicians who would like talk with really famous musicians, the back seats and like get, um, you know, advice on their careers or whatever. And just like the fact that like Uber is priding itself on its drivers being like struggling musicians says a lot about like, um, you know, how sort of like the struggles of artists are being sort of like, I don't know, like in that case, like kind of in this really like weird fucked up way that's not making any sense, like trying to like commodify the experiences of struggling artists to defend oh, the labor yeah. conditions that you're forcing your workers to exist within. Um, Absolutely. You know, I mean, for- like tech, com- tech companies do that, like as far as, you know, independent contractors or whatever, you're the... The, the struggling and uh, suffering thing is is very much part of, you know, because it's it's an idea that like, like culture, cor- corporate business culture in the 80s and before were like, was driven by offices and driven by a particular code of behaviors and ideas. And now the idea that like, you can be a struggling person, you know, doing your own creative thing, you have your own creative projects, and you're also working for these tech companies as an employee, you know, on the side, and you're doing all this kind of stuff is like, you know, supposed to be cool, because it's better than that alternative of you know you going to this stuffy office and commuting all the time or something like that i think that's how they that's that's part of the the draw at least originally yeah um but uh, i i guess like um i don't know so i i there was a um from that interview that you did with matt dryhurst um I think that um, there were a lot of good things that he said in particular that 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 hit me because I I'm like why has no one you know expressed this before or expressed this in this way before um, but I just wanted to read a bit from that um, it says that most cor- corporate pa- platforms do not exist to facilitate unpredictability uh, and then this is a quote as ultimate as ultimately human expression is only a small part of their small part of their greater objective. Uh, they want standardized machine readable expression that in the case of something like Facebook satisfies their satisfies their ability to present tidy information to prospective advertisers. Um, and that's the thing, like, I think that summarizes everything right there. Like, I think a lot of people have questions as to whether plat- content platforms can facilitate unpredictable or um unexpected work and the answer is no (laughs) Mm -hmm. like because that's not in the business model like i mean it's not part of of what they're doing it's not part of what they're interested in they're not interested in art as as its own thing this isn't like old money old wealth you know who pay uh you know, monies to, to, to paper or to painters or like, you know, to, to whatever artist as, you know, a way to prove how much their sort of philanthropy and how much, you know, how good of and concerned about citizens they are. Like people in tech don't do this. People in tech don't believe in philanthropy. They believe in measurable outcomes. And like, so it's not going to extend to the arts, but I, I think that like people don't understand this. Like they don't understand that it's fundamentally defined by the ways that these content platforms work, that they're not supposed to facilitate un- unpredictable or uh, unexpected work. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I feel like what they're facilitating is like keeping people using their platforms, um, which is, you know, like I think why, something like Spotify, you get this sort of like filter bubble quality where it's just going to keep showing you stuff that's similar to the stuff that you already like. Um, It's not really like pushing things in new directions or anything. Like they want you to, you know, come back for stuff that they know that you already like um, so that you stay using the platform and that they keep getting their, you know, nine dollars a month or whatever and their user number going up so it like looks good for investors and i think also like uh when spotify went public i think some i saw someone posting or tweeting that like 
uh, it revealed that, you know, the, a, a lot of their revenue does come from people staying on the platform and subscribing. Um, so, I, yeah, it's like that's like their end goal. <laughs> I... Uh... I guess part of this too that like I've been thinking about because I had a, a friend who is um, a music journalist on here earlier, and I think at the time I was just really having a hard time of understanding the landscape of music journalism, and particularly why there aren't more things like what you wrote um, the with the problem with music like being written, um, and why the commentary about music seems to be stuck in a particular mode of thinking. And I think like my feeling is as somebody who used to engage a lot more with music writing is that there's a certain cultural idea um, of like a uh, pop music started to become uh, something of important cultural countercultural significance in the sixties. Um, and that's the time when, you know, more people are writing or are, are starting to participate, starting to do um, countercultural activities involving, you know, popular music and writing about it. And I think that's also, you know, that that is also partially extended to like gonzo journalism and, you know, something like. I guess like something like Lester Bangs or whatever, as far as like a music critic. And I feel like uh, traditionally um, what music critic criticism has been defined as uh, when we're thinking of something cool and like the reason that the people want to get in is something like that, where it's like, it's, it's countercultural. It's, it's engaged with um, like a lot of these particular spheres, or maybe it's engaged with like punk music a little later on, but it, it's very, uh, engaged with a particular kind of mostly white male rock music. Um, and those are the people who are getting involved and those are the kinds of genres that are being written about. And those are the kind of like, that's the kind of like mythos that is being talked about. So like, and, and that sort of came to define um, the music criticism, the music discourse that I got introduced to in like, you know, the late nineties and early two thousands with like when, when Pitchfork started out and, and also with these music blogs and also like different, uh, online forums that I was on to talk about music. Um, a lot of these, uh, ideas and commentary and things were passed down. Um, and I felt like there was this renewed interest and in, like, there was that book, um, our band could be your life about, you know, underground, uh, punk music in, in the U S during the eighties. And, you know, a lot of these bands, uh, who maybe didn't get attention in their day were starting to reform and, you know, the, the, the canons were changing slightly because, you know, music is more readily available and, you know, you find out some obscure artist from the sixties that no one talked about at the time, but was actually maybe making even more interesting music than what was being made at the time or whatever. And, and so, the, and so that, that sort of went into, uh, the sphere of indie music, but it's still essentially this, like, um, it's mostly this realm of, of white guys and also like middle to upper middle class people. Um, and when I, when I went to college, like, um, I was interested in, you know, I joined the radio, I went to a place called Oberlin, um, in Ohio. And I joined the radio station and all that. And I was like kind of looking for a musical community to connect to. And I think like uh, my first seeing of like the glimpses of that there's something off about this whole thing was um, when I was like sitting, we had to do like different work groups where we would like listen to music that was submitted, that was sent in to the college radio station. Cause college radio obviously used to be a big thing and a big like network for um, like non mainstream music to be played because of uh, these like mainstream radio being so heavily sort of commodified and defined by like corporate um goals and um so like i was in this work group and i remember talking to to you know somebody else 
and like he was talking about a particular band or whatever and he said like you know a sentence about that particular band and i thought back and i remembered and i realized that he was quoting a pitchfork article a pitchfork review and like literally quoting that as his opinion like word for word because i had read and i knew that because i had read the same <laughs> review <laughs> and and like part of this is there is this idea that you're supposed to engage with this interesting and challenging art um but uh at some level so so people were going along with that but like at some level like there's an element of like people are just kind of taking this stuff on especially kids not necessarily because they know what their interests even are but because that's kind of what it, what's expected as a music fan like you you get into the music sphere you like get into talking about music then there's like canon bands and canon like artists or whatever who are really important and depending on what you're interested in that's you know that's what you get involved with but there's an idea that like of those canons that isn't necessarily that's reflective of of older values and isn't necessarily like um reflective of the reality which is obviously a lot more complex and stuff so i think that and, and you know traditionally a lot of that is is referred to as like rockism or whatever um and i noticed that from i used to go on actually steve albini's uh electrical audio message boards and like you know there's a lot of misogyny on that on that message board and a lot of like um you know it, people just like fundamentally like i remember a thread being like uh, electronic music that doesn't suck like that that was a thread on there because the the accepted idea was that you know like electronic music sucks by default so if there's like one artist who doesn't suck then then you know we'll talk about them but whatever um and so i feel like you know the whole idea of poptimism um got introduced where you know um more mainstream artists particularly like black artists like hip hop and um you know r&b and mainstream pop sort of became more a part of the commentary um as a way to kind of challenge or um you know kind of uh yeah place like a challenge to this this whole kind of stuffy mode of commentary that isn't necessarily reflective of all the different things that are going on in the the culture but i feel like in a way I, I feel I wonder how much like we've we've almost overcompensated because there's this I, there's a really good uh, flip side to the way that the music industry has changed in that um, there are more places for more diverse artists from diverse backgrounds that has more of a uh, a place in the music sphere and like people just have to accept that if they go to a music festival or something that it's going to be you know all women and non-binary people or whatever who are playing or you know something like that um and that's not something you know those aren't people who were allowed to be part of the the sphere be beforehand but the the flip side of that is that like i think i mean i think it's just in general like the conversation about neoliberalism and and our culture and the idea that like um you know a lot of these companies take on diversity as a way to show you know how woke they are or whatever but really that um that success or whatever only extends to a small number of artists and most artists including you know especially most marginalized artists are still left out in the cold in this so i guess like my point uh, in this whole spiel is i feel like i i've always sensed like a lot of problems in the critical sphere around music and i feel like um it's at sort of an impasse right now where like um you know the sphere of think pieces that talks about how you know secretly subversive or woke this like lana del rey song is or whatever um it, uh it's either that or you know the people who are still stuck in the same mode of like this thinking that i think still comes from the 60s and this idea of of like this rock star or musician as a celebrity and countercultural thing uh with music that doesn't necessarily 
reflect that in the current landscape. Um, so I feel like there, there needs to be like a reevaluation or a, a new movement or something happening that, that, you know, isn't, that isn't stuck in these old modes of thinking that are, you know, racist, classist, uh, sexist, whatever, but aren't also just basically, uh, pro corporate, uh, speak. And I don't know where exactly that's coming from, that's going to come from, but I, I do know from like engaging with a particular artist that I like on Bandcamp that I found like a lot of diverse array of artists that I'm interested in, not just because they're diverse or whatever, but because I'm interested in their music and, you know, challenging music. You know, I was really into, um, a multiple sort of electronic music, uh, artists from Iran because their approach to composing music is totally outside, you know, any sort of models of thinking about uh, music that we have. And there's this sort of freshness or unpredictab unpredictability to that. Or, you know, an another sphere, like there's a lot of good music being made out there. But I wonder how we can, I feel like we have to almost create a new sort of way of thinking about um, a musician that isn't so um, kind of, you know, steeped in so many of the problems with music culture. And a lot of these, like, uh, a lot of this mythos kind of serves as a justification for all the problems of, of music culture. And I feel like there needs to be a reevaluation of that that um, doesn't you know, completely dismiss the music of the past or dismiss the things that people were made, but still challenges it and still provides like a more holistic way of thinking about it. And like, for me, I, that's just not something that I see very often. Like it's very rare. And I feel like there's this ingrained cynicism and it's frustrating to me because I know that like, I, I write about video games and like, people don't take video games seriously unless they already pay attention to video games. Like as a cultural object, it's not something that people take seriously. And that's something that, you know, I try and challenge in my writing, but like, and it feels like there's a, at least a handful of people willing to do that. But I, I feel like on almost in music, you have a more interesting, uh, more developed art form to talk about. And yes, the, and let, and yet there's less energy behind it. Um, and like, yeah, I, I do see glimpses of something new, but um, I don't know, I guess I guess that that is my issue with the music sphere in general. And I guess if we want to pose a challenge to Spotify or streaming services or the way that this is defining the way that people consume music, I guess we have to have a dialogue about some of the past problems of the music sphere and how to find a way to challenge that that is still that is not going to be reactionary and looking towards the past but looking towards the future totally i mean i think that your perspective is really interesting and also like everything that you just said i'm like snapping over here like that i think you know this this stuff all happens like you know in a context like nothing that is happening in the present is like happening in a vacuum and i'm glad i mean i'm happy about the way that the conversation about independent music has like changed in terms of like the capital i like indie music world that gets covered on like big music websites and that gets released by these like legacy indie rock labels or whatever and i feel like everyone is sort of like you know, having this reckoning over the past few years that, like, this thing has to, like, really, um, you know, have this period of, like, reflection and interrogation of its history and um, making space for artists who haven't historically been represented, um, been represented um, by these, you know, companies and platforms and stuff. Um, but we do, you do run the risk of stuff being exploitative and at the end of the day, like, who serves to benefit? Like, and it's hard because... Um, you know, I believe in people, especially artists, you know, having the ability to make their, make their own decisions and like do what makes sense for you, like, um, read up on the history of the different things that you engage with or whatever, just like make the most educated, um, you know, decisions that you, you can. And like, it, I don't know, I feel like so much of what we've been talking about is it is so hard to make a living as an artist and like some people don't, but like I do believe in 
people's ability to make a living off of their art if they want to. And like, I, I honestly can't believe that there are some people who don't believe that that should be an option for people, but there are. There's some people who just fundamentally don't think that like art should be something that people can make a living off of. Um, and if we're going to exist in a world where corporations freely feel like they can exploit artists for their own personal gain, then I do feel like we have to, you know, exist in a culture where art artists can see some of the profits of that system of exploitation and push back and like, and, you know, have conversations and learn, learn and figure out like how to do things in a way that makes sense for them and draw their own lines about like what they're comfortable with or like, you know, what makes sense for them. And um, I think about, you know, the future of music or the future of independent music. I just feel like um, the, you know, we like need to be moving to a place where like that means like a ton of different things and where artists have different options and where independent artists aren't expected to like, you know, if, if people want to like, I don't have a problem with a concept of optimism, but I do have a problem with the idea that all artists should have to carry out their business in the same way that pop musicians do and that all artists should have to like think the same way that pop musicians do, which ultimately is the problem. One of the biggest problems with Spotify, I think it's like all artists being expected to do one, one thing. And like that is super limiting and completely at odds with like creativity <laughs> to me yeah absolutely i mean i think the things that are i mean i've said this before but like um i think the things that are the most interesting to me about pop music w which i do think is absolutely totally worth talking about um are the things that are not commonly talked about because what is talked about oftentimes <laughs> Uh, seems to be fan fiction about the the particular star's life or, you know, like speculation on, you know, the secret meaning behind the lyrics or, or, or whatever, or, or the music video. But like, um, they don't talk about um, the sort of processes that, that make pop music, where they come from, who are the people behind the scenes who are doing this stuff. And I, I read this book called... Um, uh, God, I can't remember what it's called. Um, this the song machine. That's what it's called. Um, that talks about that stuff. That talks about like, you know, it's basically industrial processes. It's like you know, mass manufactured music. But it's really interesting and it's really fascinating. And that is the side of the industry that is invisible to most people. And I feel like it's essential if you're going to talk about pop music. So the the issue that I have. Um, is is not that like pop music is not worth worthy of talking about but the ways that people are talking about it actually kind of don't really get into depth on on what is maybe interesting about it um and you know because they don't necessarily reflect super well on the industry and um mm -hmm. you know uh, the industry relies on you know, the artist being the cool, visible person um, and all these people behind the scenes um, kind of, you know, both get the benefit and the to the detriment of not being acknowledged. You know, you're somebody like um, I was talking about this woman who is an excellent singer who um, comes up with like vocal hooks for a lot of major artists, like including like Rihanna and stuff. And um, like, that's somebody who could have her own music career. It seems like she's perfectly a hundred. She's extremely talented. Like you have to be in order to do that. But like, um, you know, she doesn't have the right look or she doesn't, you know, she isn't the right kind of vulnerable. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of these like pop stars are, are taken from sort of vulnerable or precarious situations. I mean, the big examples of that are like Britney Spears and also Rihanna. Both have sort of unstable family life um, and um, alcoholic, fa abusive fathers and kind of seek the spotlight as a way to escape that. Um, and that's excellent for the music industry because, um, you know, it's easier to mold a person like that. Um, but yeah, I feel like I that's the kind of stuff that I want to know about, you know. That's the that's the actual truth behind the facade, but but when people talk about pop music, they don't talk about that. Um and that's so like I, 
one of my yeah, biggest problems with like I, I, not one of my biggest problems but something i've been thinking about a lot is like you know spotify sort of strives to be this like magic platform and like everything about it is supposed to like be sort of like hidden and like secret so that like people just believe in like the like you know they they have the like secret genius magic of their like playlists and algorithms there's no like you know cr- there that's like built into like the like interface of like engaging with spotify and it kind of feels to me it reminds me a lot of like how like you know in, in pop music there's a lot of these like behind the scenes stuff that you never learn about and to me that is just like 1000 percent at odds with like what is so meaningful independent and underground and like diy music cultures and participatory music cultures where like you're involved and you understand what's going on and like there's like transparency or like i mean at its best you know (laughs) like obviously not always but um you know and it comes down to them just trying to sell a convenient product and, like, trying to, like, make something, like, as easy as possible as it can be for people to consume. Um, and that's, like, yeah, I don't know, just something that I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, well, I think um, something that um, that came up that, I, that I've thought about a lot as well is um, came up in your interview with uh, Matt Dryhurst where he says um, – he talks about protest music um, – and um oh, where is it uh, well i i really like this quote it says we also we run this risk of making music so bland that it's of no p- um okay yeah here here we go um centralized influences and centralized incentive models also create boring ass music it creates boring ass culture dryhurst declared if you design a system that privileges back catalog you're going to get a lot of music that sounds like back catalog you're going to get a lot of pop music that sounds like pop music from the 80s we also run this risk of making music so bland it's of no political consequence anymore i fear that to some extent this has already happened and then he also goes on to say about how like protest music hasn't really evolved very much which is something i've noticed a lot like um pro- most protest music that does exist uh you know harkens back to the era of like bob dylan or or whatever like it it it's steeped in cultural ideas that aren't particularly relevant or meaningful to current cultural consciousness but you know it's funny to me when i think about this more cuz like this was like um, he was affiliated with with Holly Herndon, and she released an album called Platform uh, in 2015 that kind of talks about some of these ideas. And you know, the funny thing is, like, I learned about that album and I listened to it, and like, it only occurred to me because of like the commentary that I read about it was like very much like, oh, this is weird, kooky, experimental album. You know, it it doesn't get into the ways that it's trying to engage in as as almost like a form of protest and like i actually started listening to the lyrics and like understanding like okay this isn't just like this like aesthetic cultural object but this is actually making a statement about culture and whatever but i only noticed that after like listening to the album probably like five or six times and actually like understanding the lyrics because like um the idea that something that is uh, you know avant-garde digital experimental also being protest music is that when it's not on its face about what it is like it's not really obvious to people that that's what it's doing and you know like one of my favorite albums of all time that is also probably one of the most popular albums of all time of the last 20 years uh, is a hundred percent a protest album but almost nobody seems to know that it's a protest album or engage with it in that way and i'm thinking of like kid a in particular the the radiohead album which is like you know in in, like explicitly about um things like neoliberalism um and and culture and 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 making a statement on it in a way that is very abstract but you wouldn't know that for all the engagement of this album because like Everything that has been written about that album says, you know, that this is like, you know, it places it in this context of like, oh, well, like Radiohead was the greatest rock band and then they did this thing and it blew everyone's minds. And it's not talking about the actual ideas. It's talking about like this like myth or or story behind it. And it's talking about how like, you know, X or Y is a genius, but it doesn't get into like what 
musical ideas and influences are being expressed, at least not that deeply. And this is an album that has probably been written about almost more than I, you know, almost more than any other album, or at least uh, when it came out. And yet so little of the engagement on that was actually engaging with the ways that, you know, this could be seen as a protest album or whatever. And that, and that kind of uh, makes me feel um, kind of frustrated and like, um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like de-energized from that because knowing that there are so pe- few people engaging with this work, with these works in general in the way that they deserve to be engaged with. And that's like, that's something that that needs to change and there needs to be a different idea of how to engage with more kind of complex and challenging art in general and like yeah protest music um music that kind of challenges these things is going to sound different now than it did in the 60s because you know in the 60s i guess the easiest and cheapest thing to do was to pick up a guitar and like write folk music but now like the easiest thing to do is make beats on like a computer because you know like everyone has a computer or most people have a computer and like it's easy to just pirate or you know cheaply purchase a some kind of sequencer um and find samples online and and do some sort of recording and that that that's probably the easiest uh and most uh accessible thing to do so obviously you know what is coming out in our culture is going to be different depending on that and i i feel like that's that's the ways in which uh the music sphere hasn't adjusted to um the ways that culture exists now both in both in the negative way when we're talking about spotify but also in the positive way when we're talking about art that is made primarily digitally that is disseminated digitally that that maybe has a different um ways of expressing uh its points in a way that isn't direct and steeped in this whole like you know idea of uh rock starness which is already like it's self-destructive because you know so many so this myth of like the rock star and all this kind of goes into um has so many people who have led tragic lives or who have had led lives that have ended early because of drug use and and everything else and the whole back background to that um drug use and whatever is people trying to process or deal with being exploited by the industry um and like you know a lot of that stuff is just i just forgotten about cast off so i don't know it's i think it's a real challenge but like um, I think not only do we need to think about um, music as um, you know a way of how can independent artists make money, but also I think we should think about <laughs> um, how to make people feel excited and not in despair and not feel like they have to make music. Like help feel people feel like they're part of something like they're part of some sort of movement in some way or you know that they're being acknowledged or being paid attention to and i think that that's like one crucial element of this that like when we just focus on the money which is obviously important um it's easy to miss like you know that element of like you know what what makes people excited what makes people want to participate and throw their hat into the ring and do their own sort of unique thing yeah totally um well just wanted to to backtrack a little bit i was uh taken by surprise to hear you say kid a i've never really thought of that i mean i i I honestly haven't listened to in a really long time but i'll have to go back and listen to that album um and then in terms of like the aesthetics of protest music it's also interesting because I actually don't can't really think of very many like acoustic guitar like protest albums from um, the past like that really struck me actually like maybe you know like the Hooray for Riff Raff album that came out last year I thought was really yeah amazing. I did I thing. I do like that album as well but then in terms of protest music I feel like it's mostly like punk and hip hop and electronic music like I think I do, mm. but also I, I don't know it, I don't know if it's necessarily like the common perspective or whatever but yeah i do think of that holly herndon album as like one of my favorite like sort of like pro i don't know if it's like protest albums but like albums that protest in some way um and 
yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like when I think of, you know, protest music, another person who comes to mind is like more mother who, who, and I, you know, I don't know, like a couple weekends ago, I saw, I went to this like three day festival in New York. That was like Jalen Ir- irreversible entanglements were there. And it was like Sonra <sighs> orchestra, like, I don't know, a bunch of other people. And like, I think of all yeah, of, a lot of those. I don't know most of these artists. In, in some way. Um, and they're like, okay. you know, m- making music with, that's, I don't know. Anyway, um, just thinking, yeah, it's, it's like a big, I definitely do, you know, part of the, so the interview that I did with Matt Dryhurst was part of this series that I was doing called Protest Platforms. So it's kind of thinking of like all the different ways that music like can protest in 2018 and like trying to like feature people who are working on different types of um, platforms. So I wrote about Resonate, which is this music streaming cooperative based in Berlin. And I wrote about Cash Music, which is this open source, um, this nonprofit. This th- th- Cash Music is a nonprofit that gives open source tools to artists so that they can distribute their music directly to their fans. Um, and like all of it, so, so it was about Cash Music, Resonate, and Saga. And the idea was kind of like, write profiles of some organizations and individuals that are trying to, like, give artists more agency, um, and, like, how platforms have always kind of been part of music's ability to protest, whether it's, like, through people creating, like, underground punk record labels or, like, running, like, independent record stores or whatever, and how there have always been people who are making platforms and kind of, like, businesses, like, in opposition to the status, the major label status quo, um, and how, like, today the sort of um, things that artists are up against are, like, way different than they were in the 80s. So, like, what will, like, you know, today's types of, like, resistance movements, like, in music, like, look like, or what could they look like, or, like, and not necessarily having any answers, but just trying to, like, open up some questions around it, because I kind of feel like we're we're really in, like, more of, like, a question period of time right now than, like, answer, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I kind of feel like, there is, like, this disconnect where, like, musicians are being, like, super impacted by technology, but, like, most musicians, like, don't know how to, like, create their own tools for distributing their own music. If, say, they were, like, oh, I don't want to interact with any of these corporate platforms. Like, I want to, you know, make my own thing or whatever. But, like, most people don't have the um, resources or whatever. Um, So, so yeah, I think that, like, the whole purpose of that series is just kind of, like, start sort of try to like drive some conversations in the direction of like what could some alternatives look like what could some futures look like where artists like do have like access to like open source tools to like build their own things um or be part of streaming cooperative that's an interesting idea like uh, stuff like that well yeah i think people forget that um the internet was created with more egalitarian purposes and there's more of an idea that like you know these things should be accessible to everyone um and it's easy to see tech as because of the way that the tech industry has exploded as just fundamentally a venue for um you know corporate profits and devaluating art devaluing art and stuff but like tech is tech in itself like when we're not talking about the industry we're talking about like tech it's neutral like values are being imposed on it by the tech industry because it is a major corporate business but like there there's a lot of potential for different ways of 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 making and disseminating stuff and i think like um i don't know maybe as somebody who's been around the internet for a long time and also like I lived in the Bay Area for a while, so, like, I, you know, and, like, one of my my first roommate um, when I moved there was somebody who was, like, a tech startup person and, like, you know, 100% drinking the, the tech startup Kool-Aid. And I think that's, like, when I realized that, like, this is not for me. Um, but there's, I think, this idea um, that because that culture that culture was just not on the radar of a lot of maybe musicians and artists they didn't see it as necessarily important or they just didn't understand it and and i feel like that's a theme and that's also a theme of why my show is called beyond the filter and all that stuff is because like just because something is happening uh, in a sphere that you don't understand or that you might not care about doesn't mean that it's not going to have a major impact on culture in one way or another. So you should probably be aware of that and be like curious about it. Um, 
because I think that, uh, you know, these like filter bubbles or whatever, um, in encourage passivity and encourage um you to not seek out those answers but i think that like we have to go against that and seek stuff out and i think the place to start is to find stuff that you know you might not take seriously or you might not understand and be like i'm gonna have a serious look at this what what is this you know what what is actually here and i i feel like i try and do that i try and not pass judgment on particular forms of art because i think that's another thing that frustrates me like you know i don't particularly i'm not a huge fan of like chiptune music but that is a huge industry um or you know and like a lot of the music that that sells the best on bandcamp almost universally is like video game soundtracks or chiptune music and so that's a that's a significant part of the industry and that's something that maybe like you don't have to like it or whatever but um i think that's something that's worth engaging with critically because if something is having an impact on you know one part of a culture then um you know maybe it's worth talking about and i think having been involved in the video game sphere it's a little bit more um tied to the internet so people are a little bit more understanding of the ways that the internet sort of defines what people see and don't see um but I feel like, you know, in other in other realms and other media, like that's kind of a blind spot. So that's something that, you know, hopefully um, understanding content platforms and, and, and disseminating information about this and like not just kind of going back on the like, you know, because our, our not only is like digital space colonized, but real life space is even harder to find with people because of, you know, in cities like raising you know larger and larger rents and like the money goes to people who are interested in like real estate development and other things like that they're not interested they're not people who are interested in creating any sort of community space and you sort of have to go against that in order to exist and it's a tremendous amount of labor on everyone who's involved so like we have to treat I mean, I guess the, the overarching theme of this podcast is we have to treat like um, the Internet as a space to organize on as well. And, um, you know, everything we do on there is is, you know, we have to treat it as as a, just another space where we can meet people and make connections and stuff and, and understand how these how and why these platforms work, because they're they're not going away anytime soon. Uh, and I feel like people in underground music have like long been sort of of like resistant to like think of that like possibility of like organizing online because like underground music communities are so rooted in like um you know touring and shows and selling tapes and records and like real like physical stuff and like uh i very much like don't want any of that to go away and it's like a bummer to have to spend time that you could be spending on that kind of like real life stuff like on um, thinking about like digital space as well but like when it comes down to it like it is inescapable reality that we live in a world that is extremely shaped by you know platforms and um, platform monopolies and digital media companies and um, tech companies and like if these are supposed to be cultures of resistance like they have to include resistance to you know that as well yeah and that's also gonna like i mean i feel like a lot of artists want to think of their music as apolitical i mean i think like the, the way that we conceptualize politics is often really um bad and and straightforward and not you know um something that is capable of engaging with nuances and art but like i think everything is political in the way that anything a person does is political and reflective of that culture. So like, you know, what, what kind of music you're choosing to make, how you're choosing to disseminate it, every decision that you're making about your music can be political. And, and people should definitely think about like, you know, not only like, um, how, you know, not only like about what content platforms or what community spaces you make, but also just like, how does that affect your music? Like, how does 
how how does making music that is aware and and conscious of this stuff and trying to shake off you know or at least change the context um around a lot of these discussions what is that going to look like and i think also music criticism is part of that and i wonder if i don't know as somebody who's also a, mus a musician and um well uh, so so you're a musician and a music critic and i feel like um I feel like those two careers are often career paths are often very separated from each other. Um, I don't know. Is that something that you've, uh, I, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, is it just like, a, a, a is it just like a, a matter of like, uh, making a, you know, you, if you hyper specialization, like you choose to make a career in one thing, then that's your main focus or whatever. But like, I see very few musicians writing, you know, think pieces or whatever, and very few people writing think pieces, like releasing music. I don't know. Is that, is that, is that it, true or? It's interesting. Cause I definitely consider myself like professionally, like a journalist and I've been writing about music for much longer than I've been involved in music projects and mostly for me like playing music is just something like to do with my friends for fun like on the side like once every every once in a while like have played one show this year like uh played like three shows last year you know it's not something that takes up a lot of space in, in my life but mm -hmm. i am like i do think that even just minimally you know playing music has allowed me to engage more with the music community and i think understand some of the struggles of artists like a bit like I don't know I want to say more because I think that it's really possible for people who aren't playing music and I don't play music that much to um, understand like you know these systems and stuff but I I am like you know grateful for the perspective that it's offered me um, but yeah I don't uh, I feel like I feel like that insight is often missing in uh, people you know you choose a particular career path because this is this is a problem with a lot of like writing about particular, um, you know, media in general is that uh, the people who are writing about it aren't necessarily people who are making or actively participating in the spheres around it. I don't know. It's just like I'm interested in music writing and I'm also interested in making music and putting it out there. And mm -hmm. I feel like both of those things inform one another. Like I want to have a more musical understanding that I can express in words and also in music. And I feel like, you know, more musicians maybe, I, I, I feel like m maybe, um, you know, more critical writing could use the perspective of more musicians who are actually working mm -hmm. and, and doing stuff. And, and, and I feel like, um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, music could, uh, could could benefit also for having more people who are writers who are more critically engaged and and think about um you know the the deeper issues and and don't just sort of kind of aren't just pretend to be 100 percent apolitical or whatever so i don't know i i think that like for me like the way to uh imagine something else is also to like intersect these things and have them uh be a part of the same movement or whatever rather than something that is separate yeah totally it'd be great also like i feel like there are people who report on i guess music business or music technology or something but it'd be great to see like more of that writing incorporate more um reporting on artists experiences like talking to artists about their experiences navigating um these platforms and systems um instead of like just you know uh, looking at what the companies have to say and what their pre press releases say and like writing about changes on the platforms like okay how about like how well, how are people's experiences changing um, to yeah totally um, so I think I think uh, we should wrap up but is there anything else you you wanted to mention or talk about before we go um, I think that we covered like a ton of stuff um i really appreciate all of your sentiments as well and stuff and like everything that you've added to the conversation totally i mean <laughs> this podcast is partly just an excuse for me to talk to people i don't get to talk to otherwise yeah. and, no. you know throw throw around ideas and then make it public so that other people can can hear it because i don't know yeah cool well thank you so much for having me on no problem so i you are Liz Pelly, and uh, the article 
um, that we talked about. Well, we talked about a few different articles, but the problem with M- Muzak is one of them. Is your, your website is just lizpelly.com, right? Yes. Okay. And you have more of your selected works and stuff on there. And also uh-huh. you're on Twitter at, um, at Liz Pelly. Is that correct? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much.